I might have to use the mic. Does that work? Can you hear me? Um, so I'm a lawyer. It's very hot outside. I'm not going to give you any legal detail. But I'm also only going to talk about England because that's the jurisdiction I know best. Um, you will have heard from Ken that everything is better in Scotland, mostly better in Wales, and quite a lot of better in Northern Ireland as well. So we are dark times in England in many ways, in my view, and particularly in property context. So property in the city, this is very much about land use, which is that's my area, that's what I work on. And who does the city belong to very much in the sense of who owns the city in terms of land? To the question here, my central argument that I want to put to you is that the city, and I'm thinking about the local authority here, so it's the mechanism for governance, is more self-sufficient than we might assume through property rules and public law rules. And property will often travel, this is public law much less so. By public law, I mean judicial review, so the basis on which you can, as a citizen, hold the local authority to account, which in England is very, very limited. It's primarily procedural, not exclusively procedural, but primarily. The court can't make a decision that the authority has already made substantively. The city and the local authority is also less self-sufficient than we might assume because of national rules and austerity, and this fits into what Craig was saying. And commercial interests evidence in both, and that's one of the themes I want to put through. So I've got three examples for you. Um, one is a transaction, one is a dispute, one is a piece of litigation. And again, three, so property, public, and commercial interests. So it's a three of threes. So this is where we find ourselves this afternoon, a beautiful city on a beautiful day. It helps my point of view now that there are no people that you can really see in this picture. So just imagine a world without people, which would not be good. But we all see different things. I once did this with engineers, and one said they saw airflows, and another said they saw foundations and basements. Um, I see land use lines. So for anyone who knows Oxford, that would be Brasenose College on the left. We've got the Sheldonian in the middle. We've got All Souls. So pretty much private property, college property. And then I start to get excited with the street, because that is one of the few public spaces we have in England, because of an important decision called DPP and Jones. If you go further up on the left, you've got the town hall, public property. If you go further out still, you'll find more public property still, uh, sports centres, schools, to the extent that they're not academised. So the first example I want to take you to is Bristol, which is uh, now my hometown. And I want you to think about where you might be in 250 years in the future. Because what is happening in Bristol, and it's happened for some time, is the enclosure of the city centre, to be wrapped up as a commodity and sold and bought by investors. So in, I think 2010, I wrote a paper called Shopping in the Public Realm, um, where I talked about Cabot Circus and how that was bought. Um, so it's a lease for 250 years. So the city still owns the freehold. A shell company was set up at that time between Hammersons and Land Securities. And they bought the, this area and bundled it up and made it into a beautiful new shopping centre beautiful depending on your taste, but most people in Bristol seem to like it. It has not been an unpopular de development. So I thought all that was behind me, but to know we have a new one coming, which is what I'm going to talk about today. But in terms of the value, and I thought this map was great, I always think of Joan, and I think of cartographic anxiety, but on the map. But here is Hammerson's annual report. So Cabot Circus, which is what the development is called in Bristol, is now worth 643 million, so I left at the end. So its, worth, its assets are worth 643 million, and it has 40 million just about operating profit. So that's from the shops and the restaurant leases running through it. So the city centre has been enclosed through master planning, compulsory purchase, highway stocking up, bundled up for 250 years. That lease has been sold to a shell company, initially Land Securities and Hammersons. In 2014, Land Securities stepped back, AXA, the insurers went in. So 36 acres are now bundled up, owned by that shell company. If you look on the map of who owns Bristol, it still says we own Bristol because the, the, the city council has the freehold. But we don't get to have it back for 240 odd years now. Yes. So that was good, and what's happening is the reproduction of these practices. We talk about policy transfer in the public sector, in the private sector, this is happening all over England. It didn't happen in Sheffield because Hammerson decided it wasn't enough profit in pure financial terms. But it's also rolling out now, again, across Europe. So having thought that was done, we have an area in Bristol called Broadmead, which is still owned by the City Council, the Freehold. And you will see that it's not nearly as glamorous on the right as Cabot Circus. Um, it is 
discursively still public, but one of the things I work on is the legal differences between public ownership and private ownership, and take it from me, they're not very big or important. But again, what is happening is that you're drawing a line around the area, and then you're transposing it onto a map. And what's happening here is quite technical. They're not granting a new lease on their own. They're also requiring the surrender of some leases, the merging, and then a new lease to the Bristol Alliance. And so when this is in the papers, the big debate is about the extent of the parking in terms of planning. But in terms of the property transfer, there's not much discussion of who actually is the Bristol Alliance. It's a shell company. Um, on law, whether or not we should be granting another lease for 250 years. It's seen as a way to get money in. So that road in the middle, if you can see the middle of those pictures, will be stopped up, and what was once public space again will be privatised for 250 years. So that's the public, that's the property side of it. Public law, there's no challenge. This is just a transaction. In terms of commercial interests, I e emailed the council to say, could I have a copy of the lease as a citizen? After four goes, getting no reply. Um, I eventually emailed again and they told me I could have a copy of the lease when it goes to the land registry. But once it gets there, it will be redacted, so I went to the price, so I went to see a lot of interesting terms. So there are questions about transparency and the commercial interests becoming obscured. It seems like just an action by the local authority. So in terms of self-sufficiency, yes, the local authority have the self-sufficiency to sell off another set of acres of our city centre. And it's next to the initial development, so that stuff in Fawn is already have a surface, there's a, there's a change in the leases which is why the boundary includes it. But that's my first example of how you um, can be self-sufficient and you have an awful lot of authority. My second one will be familiar to anyone who knows their way around affordable housing in England. So affordable housing in England, most local authorities will have policy guidance that says if you build a new development you should have between 30 to 40 percent affordable housing. Whatever the definition of that is, you should build new houses. But there is a paragraph in the National Planning Policy Framework, so the national becomes relevant and limits the self-sufficiency. And this says that it has to be viable, and that is if it is viable between a competitive landowner and a developer. And essentially for viable, we need profitable. So if it's not profitable on the spreadsheets put forward, then they won't have to be held to provide affordable housing. And this is what happened, is happening at Townsie, sorry, Hornsey Town Hall in Harringay in London. So this is an old, rather run-down town hall that's just been sold to Far East Consortium, a Hong Kong-based set of developers, for 3.5 million. They're doing up the building for an art space and public space outside. But when it initially has gone through planning, um, there was no requirement for affordable housing. Notwithstanding that Harry Newt said 40% should be affordable, so that would be 59 of 146 houses. So it goes through, though there are two opportunities here for Harry Newt to extract value. One, when they sold the freehold, and two, when they did planning. And at neither point did they do so. So yes, they're constrained nationally by the viability provisions of the NPPF. They have to have competitive landowner. But they could have argued much harder, is the argument, when they sold the land in the first place. There's some negotiations going on. They're being encouraged. There's a cultural resistance in, ha in Harringay. And they're probably going to get at least 11, maybe more affordable units. Bear in mind that affordable in England can just mean affordable, sorry, 80% of market rent in London in particular. So that's not necessarily terribly affordable in practice. Mm. Different authorities have different rules. In Bristol, our housing needs very much the social rent, not affordable rent. So again, there is some self-sufficiency there. But so, Harry here, here, they have self-sufficiency. They are caught by the national rules, but they have more choice than, than we might think. My last example is Finnsbury Park, and this is about property in the park. So Finsbury Park is a, is a very classic English park, created by the Victorians, um, lots of fundraising, lots of subscriptions, got American gardens in it, and it has events in it. And increasingly what's happening in London is that the parks are being used for large-scale festivals. Um, and that's releasing quite a lot of money. So again, in Harringay, there's a lot of litigation and disputes in Harringay, I find out. So 446,000 is what the council received from Live Nation, who are a music Venue, uh, sorry, they put on festivals basically, come from Mean Fiddler, so a whole set of corporate restructuring from Mean Fiddler. And they wanted to put on this, this festival in the summer called the Wireless Festival. And so Finsbury Park, that looks very mundane on one day, looks like this when the festival is there. And the friends of Finsbury Park complained, 
Um, they complained in 2016 before the festival went ahead. They failed at first instance by the time it came to the Court of Appeal, the 2017 festival had already gone ahead. So they're not going to be able to stop it. And they lost in the Court of Appeal. And the reason they lost was because when it comes to parks, I'll just go back a second. So if you can imagine a park like this, there's Victorian legislation from 1890 which says you can only have 10% of the park licensed for profit. There's another piece of Victorian legislation, which is now being incorporated, which says only for 10 days. So this was about 25% of the park plus for about three weeks. So they were clearly in breach of those Victorian legislations, but there's also a bit of 1970s legislation which says a local authority can do as it sees fit. So what happened was that the court decided in favour of the local authority and said, yes, you can go ahead and you can rent out the park in this way. And I don't know if anyone read The Guardian this morning, but this is the same um, with many festivals, the Brockwell Park, for example, um, where it's now about half a million is the going rate. And again, transparency here is limited because when it comes to the dispute, it's only about whether or not the local authority had the authority to make the decision. Give the local authority. That's the way public law works. So they are constrained if you're a citizen, but you're empowered if you're a local authority. So they can just give them away. They can rent it. Now, they do have an outdoor events policy of 2014, and there's a reasonable amount of good governance here. And I wouldn't want to say necessarily that the festival shouldn't go ahead. But my point really is that they are self-sufficient because they are the landowner, they have the property, public law works in their favour, and the commercial interest, what really disappears in this dispute, is how much money Live Nation are going to make out of it. And what you find is that music venues are shutting and using parks to generate income is a very profitable line of business at the moment for music operators. So, can I just get to the end? The reason I think we can feel more sympathetic for local authorities, and Jonathan alludes to this, is austerity. And I think if you're not in England, it's probably hard to imagine how bad local authority austerity has been and is going to keep getting. So I know these graphs are not terribly easy to see, but the green lines are basically where we're going. And the more deprived the local authority, the bigger the cuts, because the way the funding works. The council of despair comes from The Economist. And what you can see is, particularly in the built environment, there's up to 60% cuts on average. So planning departments have been particularly savaged. But parks have been savaged. In Bristol, for example, the proposal is that there's no funding to go to parks. Parks have to become self-sustaining. So they make their money from putting on events. So that's clearly a constraint on self-sufficiency. So just to conclude, property in the city is produced by property, property law, public law, the lack of ability to challenge a local authority, and commercial interests. The three come together. But critical is how much authority the landowner has, so how much the city, the local authority owns. And there's a huge programme at the moment in its sixth ways now, sixth way called One Public Estate where everything's being encouraged to be sold off, local authorities are selling off. There's a huge, huge programme of land privatisation that's been going under the radar. And one public estate is part of that. But the landowner, as long as you own the land, you can set the agenda for the land. You can include, you can have a lease on it. So in, in the case of Cabot Circus and Broadmead, it's 250 years. And you can create as many sub-leases as you like and slice up time, so as long as each one is shorter than the next. So in a shopping centre, you decide to build a shopping centre, you want your anchor tenant, so in Bristol, it wasn't self-reduced, too much disappointment, but it was Harvey Nichols, and so you give them a good deal, and then you give them a 15-year lease, and then they renegotiate. But as long as you can keep subletting, I think that's come through in the presentations on urban villages as well, as long as you can slice time, you can slice up space in quite interesting ways. Um, but this obviously affects who the city belongs to, so who has property in it. Commercial interests are often obscured. So in, the sh in, in Broadmead and the Cabot Circus, you can't necessarily see what's happening because you can't get hold of the lease. In Hornsey Town Hall, the viability statement is not publicly available there because it was a planning, because it was commercially confidential. Now what happened is it comes out redacted, so with bits of black with the interesting bits, and the activist's best trick in the book is to cut and paste it into a Word document and see if you get lucky. And they got lucky. So it revealed all the numbers, and it showed that they bought it for 3.5 million. We're going to get make only 22 million on that. They're allowed to charge 20% profit, and argue that all their costs are so high that they can't possibly provide any affordable housing. So transparency and viability that may be about to change at national level. Certainly, Islington have pushed, the GLA has pushed, Bristol's pushed, 
And so it is changing authority by authority. But there's no reason this information couldn't be public. <coughs> Local authorities have pretty much worked with developers to keep it commercially confidential. Whereas on the other hand, it's part of the planning and decision making, which would be conventionally public. So there's a, there's a tension there. And the commercial interests in, in Flintry Park are because live nation disappears from dispute. So public law restrictions inhibit and give local authorities significant powers to make decisions about the city. It's actually really hard to challenge them. They have decision-making power about place. So we can think about property, but when it comes to place-making, local authorities have huge powers, but they're fairly insulated. But they are massively constrained by austerity, which is what's affecting it. 